so uh, I, uh, I could talk about all that past history, and, um, uh, but I won't, because what I want to talk about is part of that collaborative project. Um, so I'm going to do some tag. And what I want to do, do with it is to reflect on two of Aravind's ideas. Uh, the idea of mild con context sensitivity, which Bob has talked about, um, and others have talked about at this, uh, at this meeting, and uh, the separate idea of near context freedom. Because mild, well, I'll, I'll get into that later. Here's an outline of the talk. I'm going to talk about those two different ideas, mild context sensitivity and near context freedom, which is where TAG is nearly context free, just a little bit more than context free in power. And then I want to talk about something that Bob also mentioned, which is the need to keep tree adjoining grammar and its relatives like uh, CCG, my own formalism, nearly context free. Because along the years, there have been a number of suggestions um, within the uh, TAG community that there are linguistic phenomena that present a serious challenge to this, uh, to this program. And I'm just going to look at three of them. I may not have time for three, but I'm certainly going to look at the first two. One is a very old analysis by Caroline Haycock of Japanese causatives. Uh, another one is a, a, an ongoing investigation of Spanish clitic climbing, little pronouns that sort of wander around in the sentence in uh, amusing ways. Uh, and finally, if I have time, I'll talk about extraposition, which is a, a, a long-standing problem uh, in almost every theory. Uh, and then, then I'll briefly conclude. Um, as previous speakers have made clear, the mildly context-sensitive class of grammars is not actually a level in the extended Chomsky hierarchy that Bob showed on his slide um, in itself. It really was first intended as a set of properties that any grammar formalism should have if we're going to take it seriously, at least in computational and psychological terms. And I would argue that that means in linguistic terms as well. And Aravind laid out a number of requirements like polynomial possibility, um, constant growth, which is um, a property that I don't have time to really spell out, um, and there were, some more the, there were some more conditions that uh, I also don't have time to dwell on. Uh, the point I want to make is that mild context sensitivity in itself, although actually that it, it, as far as anyone knows, it brings you down very drastically below the level of context sensitive languages, it's still not a very restrictive condition. It really is just the condition for any reasonable theory of, of grammar. So, for instance, Ed Stabler has recently shown, with a colleague, Michaelis, has shown that the minimalist program of Chomsky um, that is the descendant of the transformational approach that, uh, that Tony referred to um, uh, will express every device that has been pr proposed within the mi minimalist program framework. And they've shown that this is at the level of a thing called LCFRSs or multiple context-free uh, grammars, um, uh, and that is a lot of power. That is really too much freedom uh, for us to really feel that we are ad adhering to what Bob called Einstein's razor. Um, it's sometimes misunderstood, not by people in this room, but by uh, the community at large, that tree-adjoining grammar is not merely co mildly context-sensitive. It is much less power than, than, than that class of multiple context-free grammars, or LCFRS. And it's actually for that reason that CCG and tree-adjoining grammar, which are at that, at both, both at that level, um, are the only, I think it's fair to say that they're the only trans-context-free formalisms that have been taken up and used in seriously wide coverage parsing applications. I probably wouldn't make that claim in other company than in this room. But when it comes to actually parsing, uh, training on the Wall Street Journal and actually parsing with those grammars, these really, it really becomes important. These are very, uh, grammars of very low expressive power. What I want to say to the meeting today is that we should keep tree adjoining grammar lean and mean in this, in this very narrow sense at this low level. 
and that any claim that more power than basic tag is needed should, it might be true, but it should be tested to destruction as actually constituting a threat to the enterprise. And that's why I, I, I'm so taxed by the work of, uh, that I mentioned earlier and why I want to talk about it today. So I'm going to talk about three constructions that are frequently cited as requiring this greater, greater expressive power, and in particular as using some multi-component version of, of, of trio joining grammar. Some multi-component versions that you've seen today are comparatively innocent because they don't increase that expressive power. But set local multi-component tree adjoining grammar in particular increases the expressive power right up to that high level that, where you might as well be doing the minimalist program. <laughs> okay, the Japanese causatives I'll deal with comparatively. I need this little pointer thing. Is it that? Yeah, great, thanks. Um, this is a piece of work that was done before I even got to Penn by Caroline Haycock. And it, although it's cited, it's actually remarkably hard to get hold of the paper. I actually had to go along. Caroline is now at Edinburgh. So I had to go to her office and say, do you actually have this? <laughs> <laughs> and I got hold of it. And what I found, and it's, it's also treated very transparently in such cool thesis, which was a big help. What I found was that um, the construction is one where you can attach to J Japanese is verb final, there's the verb. And you can attach causatives which add an extra argument. So uh, instead of a sentence meaning Taro read the book, you can, if you add the causative, you can add another subject at the beginning which said Mitiko made Taro read the book. Causative thing, it happens in a lot of languages. Um, you can stack these things up. So here's go. Just to simplify things, I took a, an intransitive verb. Uh, go with a causative and another causative before its tense operator here. So this causative adds one argument, which is mitiko, and this causative adds another argument, me, watasi. Now, the important thing about these, Karen, Caroline Haycock argued, now, she had come to the conclusion that tree adjoining ground was very advantageous for other aspects of Japanese. So she had a good reason for doing this. But she pointed out that um, for this particular phenomenon, as TAG was defined in 1987, this construction required what I'll call the nuclear option <laughs> of set local multi-component TAG. This is, this is the one that we should all be wary of. Okay. Um, uh, and she, she proved it. I mean, it's absolutely true on that definition. However, there's something very suspicious about this construction, which is that it's nesting its dependencies. So as you stack up these causatives, each causative, the causer nests within the outer causative and its causer. And that means that this thing has all the hallmarks of being context-free, because it's A to the N, B to the N, A, A is, a, is a, a causer, B is the causative particle, it's A to the N and B to the N nesting, so it ought to be context-free. Um, why was Caroline driven to this conclusion? Well, I think that this conclusion was forced by using a version of TAG. All of our theories have sort of changed over the years. And in those days, I believe it was the case that there was a restriction on adjunction and substitution which made this... this uh, a workaround necessary. However, in fact, there is a context-free grammar of these things, and I've written it down here. You needn't worry about this semantics over here. This is just for the, to prove to the people who care about these things that this is actually doing the right thing. Um, you can actually write this context-free grammar where you, you have a recursive rule on the infinitival verb, which says you can, if you, you can have an infinitival verb followed by a causative, and then you can recurse on that symbol there. And that means you can stack up as many of them as you like. Um, however, with modern definitions of tree adjoining grammar, and by modern, I mean Joshi and Chavez 1997, so uh, I think that that's now stable. Um, adjunction and sub substitution are defined, defined in a way that allows this to be encompassed within the tree adjoining languages. In fact, it's within the tree substitution languages because it's context. 
So although this is widely cited as being problematic for pure tag, I don't think it is. And I think the, the analysis should be re redone uh, probably by somebody who's more skillful with tree adjoining grammar than I am myself and uh, can uh, check that they're uh, keeping to the rules. So I'm, now I want to turn to a second construction where, again, I th and this is partly because I'm viewing it through the spectacles of a different um, uh, uh, approach to the same problem. But it seems to me that there must be a simpler solution to this problem than we've yet arrived, arrived at. Now, the phenomenon is somewhat uh, involved, and I'm, I'm going to try and give you the intuition uh, to do with it. In uh, Spanish, like most Romance languages, including French, which is, uh, uh, you, ha you have some pronouns that are very free for their position. So this is the basic sentence meaning Mar Marie, Mary wants, and then you can have some other things, to, to allow you to see it. And this you and it can wander around in the sentence. And in particular, they can go up to the other side of the tense verb wants, and in this order, with you first and it second, um, uh, they can sort of still semantically be related to the verb that they originate with. This is the kind of thing that transformationists would use movement for, and that tree adjoining grammar tries to get away from uh, by uh, using a, a, a tree adjoining grammar analysis. Um, if I had time, I would take you through this phenomenon because there are some, it's, it's a very, there are very varied things that can happen. So for instance, the te can wander up to this, the other side of this verb, leaving the low behind. Um, but actually, you can't do the other one. You can't do the one where you leave the te down below and you take the, sorry, the you down below and you, you take the it upstairs. Um, and there's some more variation. Uh, but what I want to do is to concentrate on the first two examples I showed you, just the basic difference between the pronouns being downstairs and the pronouns wandering up to the top of the sentence. Because one thing that I didn't uh, tell you and I should have done is that uh, in this case, the second case where these guys have wandered away from their verbs, they are now in, in crossing order. So te belongs with hematir, lo belongs with ver, and the dependencies now cross. Is that, is that clear? There's sort of hematir and te, and there's ver and lo, and they're interpolated. It's te, lo, hematir, ver. Crossing dependencies. Take it from me, it's not context-free. Context um, <laughs> however, how non-context-free is it? Is it nearly context-free, or is it way up there um, in the uh, uh, set-local tree-adjoining grammars? I want to tentatively suggest that there must be... I won't give you the complete analysis, because I don't have time in any way. I haven't finished it. Um, uh, but we're among, I take it we're among friends, so... Um, now, as far as that phenomenon of crossing dependencies goes, um, this construction is strikingly re reminiscent of a, of a Dutch construction that has been treated both in TAG and in uh, my own framework, actually simultaneously and independently by me and Aravind in the early 80s. The publications took a long time to come out, but uh, that's when it happened. Um, in particular, the thing to concentrate is on is all those pronouns go in a cluster on the left, and their dependencies on the lower verbs are crossed, not nested. What that means is we can just take the analysis of Joshi 1988, and we can apply it to Dutch. And that's why I've called this Spanish Clitics in Dutch Clothing, in memory of another paper by Aravind that some of you might have remembered. Uh, I don't think you did. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd have laughed. Um, okay. Um, the way that we do this in a tag is a little technical, so I'll skip over the details. We're going to make there an initial tree, permit here into an auxiliary tree. We're going to have our original trees with the pronouns 
in their extracted position, in their, in their left position. And we're going to do a cunning thing that Aaron has invented for Dutch, which is we're going to have the verbs sort of twice in the tree, one in a raised position and one with a variable bound to them lower down the tree. And we're going to do the same thing for Permitir. Here's the verb, and here, here's its variable bound to it. And here's its, its, this is, oh, that should be an uppercase P. This is its, this is its phytic pronoun, te. Uh, it's, it's very painful to write tag trees. I did this all with x -ray. It took me hours. That's why there are still mistakes. I couldn't bear to go back and do it again. Okay, um, so what we can do is we can do the trick that Tony, uh, that, uh, that, uh, Fra uh, that Bob talked about, which is in connection with seams, which is we can tuck this Pyrmatea tree into the Ver tree um, as the dotted lines show. I didn't dare do an animation. <laughs> <laughs> we can do sort of the same thing for, this, this construction is, uh, is unbounded. You can have as many verbs as you like in between Ver and Terminir and the pronouns upstairs. So here's tucking inside another what's called trigger. This is, this is just a, a verb that's allowed to take part in this construction. And you can tuck it in and you can have as many of those as you like. I'll just do one, and it's that one there. And you see what's happening is we're, permit we're stacking up these verbs in the order of the surface string, and we're leaving behind variables bound to those verbs, and we're also stacking up the pronouns and we're able to do it in the cross order because this is the fearfully trick, the clever trick that Ar Aravind found for the Dutch construction. And we end up with this, this tree here for Mari Telokere Termina de Permitiva. It's a rather silly sentence. I just chose some verbs at random. Um, but the important thing is these things are in cross order. You can have as many Termina like verbs in here as you like, and then you have these two verbs downstairs. Um, uh, and I guarantee you that the semantics that goes with the uh, initial tree, the, t the uh, uh, elementary trees, will uh, get, get this all right. Three minutes is good. Um, now, there's a lot of loose ends here. Um, I showed you that there were some odd, odd constraints on what else you can do, and we need to fix this. We need, in particular, to limit the clitics climbing the trees according to a mechanism that I've shown you. We need to limit them, their ability to adjoin in, uh, uh, we, need, we need to restrict it to those particular verbs using features on the, uh, on the S adjunction sites. We also need to permit firmit, further lexical entries for the in situ cases where the pronouns remain downstairs. But all of this is standard in tree adjoining grammar. I don't have the least doubt that we can work these details out. I'm going to skip the last case because this is the case where I don't quite know whether we can uh, escape this uh, uh, trick. But there's a current debate going on about adjunct ad ad extra position. I could have used English for this, but the um, examples that are used in the literature are in German. And essentially, they're the same thing, that in this first sentence, the, the phrase, three books, three books, is split up the phrase, the student that had most money, is also split up, and the two, uh, the, two the, the two split trees are intercalated. So there's a problem. Um, and it's actually a hard problem for both CCG and TAG, and um, uh, I'm not going to attempt to tell you what everybody's proposing to do this, do about this. However, this, in, this construction involves extraposed relative clauses, and there are famous analyses in the transformationists have always pointed out that extraposition does not obey any rule. It's not subject to any of the constraints that normal syntactic relations are, con, uh, are subject to. Um, and it seems to me that the unconstrained dependencies that these constructions introduce may actually be essentially anaphoric in which case it's actually counterproductive to extend the grammar to them. If we can do it, that will be fearfully clever. I'm not convinced that we actually can do it. So I'm going to end with my conclusion, which is a quotation from some, a book that some of you might have read by Victor <laughs> called 
the Taylor of Gloucester, which is to indicate that this is work in progress. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I thought he was going to ask. Yes. Yes, you're quite right. I. Yes. Yes. So um, uh, it was on the slide, but I didn't mention it that, uh, this is Tonya, in the heat of the moment, I, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Tonya Bleem has, has recently shown that you can uh, analyze this construction in terms of an extension of TAG, which is called um, uh, delayed tree, uh, multi-component tree, uh, tre delayed tree local multi-component uh, analysis. But um, uh, Tonya points out in that paper, or all of you point out in that paper, that although this generalization is, does not increase the expressive power of the grammar, you're still within tree adjoining gra languages, the natural generalization is still, in the terms of the paper, is still in terms of set local. And what I'm trying to say here is that I think there's another way of talking about the construction that will, not, will make the natural generalization come out uh, from something much closer to basic tag. Also, I don't know what uh, delaying the tree local stuff does to your parser. I think it might actually make parsing uh, much more complicated. Um, so I think I'd, I'd like to work with you guys and uh, see if we can get this analysis to come out. Tonya has a question. Yes, that's right. Yes, Joan. <laughs> 